Please join me in prayer. He has shown His people the power of His works, that He may give them the heritage of the nations. The works of His hands are faithfulness and justice. All His commandments are true. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and equity. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, I think it's not coincidental that today's Gospel is all about the Word of God coming among us and the teachings of God given through Jesus Christ with authority as a prophet, but more than a prophet, as one of authority and one of healing. You see, there's a story behind why Ken wanted the Gospel book. And I'm not sure whether you know it. I don't even know how many of his family know it. So I'll share it with you now because he reiterated it several times to me. Um, Ken and Jean were, born, or were married rather, in 1962. And for their honeymoon, they went to New York City. And they were married in winter and spent Christmas Eve at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City. And Ken remembers, he remembered, and he told me the story of that first Christmas Eve that they were together. How they were there in the darkness of that cavernous church. If you've ever been there, it's the biggest church outside of the Vatican. And it's still not complete. But they were in the dark, cavernous church. And the way that they celebrated Christmas Eve was much like we do here, where the gospel would be brought out in candlelight and darkness. But they had this spotlight in the back of the church. And so the priest or the deacon, I'm not sure who it was at the time, brought out this beautiful gold-encrusted, gold and gem-encrusted gospel book and brought it out and the spotlight came on And Ken said that he'll never forget it. The glory of God's Word visibly displayed to him as that spotlight hit the Gospel book and reflected off of it and shone around the church. It was a powerful image of just what God's Word does for us, both in the person of Jesus Christ and in the writings of the Bible. And so that stuck with him and Gene the rest of their lives. And so he said, you know, what I want to do is dedicate a gospel book so that the people of God might look at it and see the glory of the Word of God and have that reflected visually as much as it's reflected in their hearts. What a powerful witness to God's Word, to God's goodness, to God's glory. And it goes so well with today's readings. After the service, I'll put out Ken and Jean's wedding picture from 1962 along with the Gospel book that you might look at. Jesus, the prophet, but more than a prophet, the authority, the healer, The Lord Jesus, as the Word of God, for He is the Word of God, brings all three of these together in today's passage. Jesus is the prophet of God. We don't speak of Jesus this way very often because we know that Jesus is more than a prophet, right? But just because He's more than a prophet doesn't mean that He's not also a prophet. His being encompasses that of a prophet. The word used for prophet in our first reading today from Deuteronomy chapter 18 
is a Hebrew word, nabi, nabi, which is thought to come from a Hebrew root, naba, meaning to bubble up, to bubble up. True prophets are spokesmen or spokeswomen divinely inspired as speakers to convey the revelations from the Lord God to his people. And in the prophet, in God's word, in the prophet rather, God's words bubble up and come forth in glory for God's people. In Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 18, God's prophet Moses knows that he's going to die. He's seen God face to face and is preparing the Hebrew people for their entry into the promised land. Moses, from his own experience, knows all too well the fickleness of God's people. You'll recall just some of the stories of Moses guiding God's people through the wilderness and at Mount Sinai. How short-sighted they are. Remember, the very first set of tablets that the Ten Commandments are written on get destroyed because Moses throws them on the ground in disgust with God's people who are worshiping a golden calf, while, even while Moses is face to face with God. And Psalm 95 and other psalms recount more stories. Moses knows that the Hebrew people will be tempted to follow anyone who claims to know God's will. And so in our Old Testament passage, he puts into place one, several characteristics of a prophet. I'm sorry, one, that they must be a brother Hebrew. Two, that he will speak in the Lord God Almighty's name. And three, that a prophet will make verifiable predictions. Number one, that a prophet must be a brother Hebrew. Number two, that they will speak in God Almighty's name. And number three, that they will make verifiable predictions. Moses' instructions on discerning prophets applies to all the prophets that would follow him, right down through the line of Jeremiah and John the Baptist to Mark chapter 1, where John the Baptist says, As a prophet, one will come after me who is mightier than I. The Hebrews understood Deuteronomy 18 to be of key significance in their Bibles. Scholar Raymond Brown writes, These particular words, that is verse 18, came to be treasured by Jewish and Christian people as one of the many predictions regarding the imitable leader or promised Messiah. And let me just read verse 18 for you. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Raymond Brown continues, The Qumran community, for example, who preserved the now famous Dead Sea Scrolls, remembered this saying and anticipated the coming of an outstanding prophet. Brown also comments that the Samaritan people see this verse as really important and in fact, in their Bibles, they move verse 18 right after the giving of the Ten Commandments. They see it that important. So as Moses ascended Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments and speak face to face with the Lord God multiple times, revealing his word and his will and his attributes, revealing God's word to his people, according to Exodus 31:18, the Ten Commandments are particular in that they're inscribed by the finger of God. And another name for the Ten Commandments is the Decalogue, right? Where are my catechism candidate students? You're out there, you paying attention? What's Decalogue mean? Do you remember? Decalogue. Nice and loud, I can't hear you, sorry. Ten ideas, or ten words. Right? The Decalogue, the ten ideas, the ten words, revealing what God desires and who God is. 
And Jesus, therefore, is another type of Moses. He's another type of prophet, another type of lawgiver, fitting all of the qualifications that Moses lays out here in Deuteronomy 18. Thus, I believe that Mark the Evangelist in today's gospel, in that selection of the gospel, is asking his readers of all time, whether those who first were listening to him or us today, to ask ourselves the question, which prophet is most like Moses? Which prophet is most like Moses? With the answer, of course, being Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the best fulfillment of Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18. You see, Mark the Evangelist wants the one who hears this passage about Jesus in the synagogue to see Jesus in this role. He's not just a prophet, but he's more than a prophet. More than this prophet fulfilled, foretold rather. And the lectionary pairs Deuteronomy 18 with Mark 1, showing that the early church understood this and understood just how important it was. In fact, John the evangelist makes this even more explicit when he says at the beginning of his gospel, what? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Talking about Jesus, right? That's that reading that the gospel came out to that Ken saw. It's the reading every year that Ken and Jean both saw there at the cathedral. Oh, that we would listen to it. Jesus is that word made flesh. Jesus is more than a prophet, but he is a prophet with the word of God in his mouth, for he is the word of God. And because of that, Jesus is also a man with authority. A man with authority. For if Jesus is true, he has authority over all things. Look at verse 15 of our first reading. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, writes Moses, from your brothers. It is to him that you shall listen. In today's gospel, Jesus teaches and even commands those creatures in the spiritual world. Look at the gospel reading we read today. Mark chapter 1, specifically verses 23 through 26. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsed him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. We as 21st century Americans sometimes miss the importance of what's going on here. You see, those around Jesus observe what he does here with amazement because he casts this demon out of this man. Those that are around him in the synagogue are amazed at his authority. First, that his teaching, and second, that he has actions to back it up. Why? Because people in Jesus' day understood spiritual authority and understood hierarchy. And what was going on here wasn't normal. It wasn't normal. Demons and angels are these creatures that are far beyond human beings. It'd smash you or I like a bug if they wanted to. There are these nine choirs of angels in between human beings and God Almighty. And here this human being is speaking to one of those and commanding him to release this man who he's oppressing. You see, they're amazed because they understood this man has power. This man is different than the rest of us. This man is different than the scribes, not just because of what he teaches, but because of his authority, because of what he can do. A man commanding a demon is a miracle. It's a miracle, and the people are rightly amazed. Jesus' is teaching also, like the ten words of God, are not advice, but commandment. 
The people observe that Jesus is different than the scribes also in how he teaches. You see, it occurs twice in this passage that they're amazed. First, in verse 22, it says, and they were astonished of his teaching. And then in verse 27, and they were all amazed by his casting out the demon. While we're constantly giving, the people in Jesus' day were constantly giving him the esteemed name teacher or rabbi. But even people in Jesus' day saw that he was more than that. And so, as Cambridge professor C.E.B. Cranfield observes, fundamental for Jesus, as for the rabbis, was the conviction that the will of God is revealed in the scriptures alone, and especially in the law. Jesus is not teaching something that's contradicting God's word in the Old Testament. God never does that. He never contradicts himself. Don't be misled by those prophets, quote-unquote, today, who say that he does. That's wrong. God is not a God of contradiction. He speaks in accordance with his word. Cranfield continues, where he's differed from them was partly in seriousness and consistency with which he followed their own basic presuppositions. But above all, Cranfield remarks, he's conscious of his personal authority. Jesus speaks as no other man can speak because he's the perfect prophet and the Son of God. And indeed, even as the demon confesses, the Holy One of God. The good professor, Cranfield, is observing that Jesus clings tightly to the text of Scripture, methodically in his teaching, speaking in such a way that would not be inappropriate for, that would be rather inappropriate for anyone else because of his personal authority. And what Mark often does in his gospel is shows this teaching and then follows it up with an example. And so here we see Jesus' teaching going forth in power and glory, but then the example of exorcism going forth also in power and glory. And let's not note the final point. What is Jesus doing in speaking forth his word here? Because a lot of people stop there and don't understand. They say, well, this is a miracle and it proves that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, yes. But what's Jesus doing here? What's he doing? What's the result of his action? Well, you could say there are many. What does an exorcism do? Freedom. It brings freedom. It releases this man from oppression. It releases this man from Satan's oppression. God's glory shines forth and brings freedom to this man who's suffering so much that he can't even speak for himself. Do you see that in the passage? The man comes up to Jesus. The man's not speaking to Jesus. I mean, he is, but it's not his soul that's speaking to Jesus. It's this demon speaking through him. And Jesus speaks to him and gives him this exorcism that brings a healing and a release and a freedom. So the observation here is not necessarily to pit God's reliableness against his goodness, but to say his goodness goes hand in hand with his power and reliability. Do you see? Jesus speaking in this way brings together his authority and his goodness, revealing God's desire for mankind to be free to love and serve the Lord. Another scholar observes that in Mark's Gospel, <clears throat> at least, there's as many verses about Jesus healing and doing exorcisms as there are about Jesus' passion and death. That should say something to us. Jesus is coming, dear friends, is good news. The Gospel is good news. It should shine forth in glory, not just reflecting in us, but into the world and disrupting the works of the devil, disrupting the order that is not of God, 
bringing forward a new order, the kingdom of heaven. We can't miss the fact that that new order is to restore and to heal as well as subjugate Satan's minions. I think Mark the Evangelist wants us to walk with Simon and Andrew and James and John in the footsteps of this Jesus, particularly this Sunday, to see how Jesus is the man that Moses foretold, to see that Jesus is the man of true authority with the only authority to always speak what is right, to see that Jesus can command demons, authorities even beyond us, and finally, to see that it is Jesus' interest as God's Son to help men and women who no one else can help. The people in the synagogue are amazed, but do they obey? Jesus' fame has increased, but do men come to follow him? Well, we'll have to wait and see where Mark takes the gospel. Do we understand, however, the significance of what's being given to us today? This week, I was watching some lectures and listening to some podcasts on cultural trends in America. Do you know that one of the biggest questions being asked right now is not, does God exist? That was kind of a question that was asked 20, 30 years ago. It's still asked, don't get me wrong. But it's not the biggest question that people are walking around asking today. Rather, the biggest question that people are asking is, is God good? Is God good? Which is a very different question. Dear friends, dear Christians, we have an answer for that. Mark has an answer for that. Yes, God is absolutely good. God loves his creation. Just look at the Jesus of the Gospels. Just look at the Jesus of the Bible. Look at the exorcisms, the healings, the forgiveness. Look at what he desires. For he desires that you and I might be free to serve and love him. Jesus is the prophet. What he says goes He has the words of God in his mouth. We do not have the right as his followers to contradict that. Jesus has the authority. Jesus can break every bond. Everything that other people cannot touch. Jesus has the power to change. Bring those things to him. And finally, Jesus is good. You can trust him. You can trust him with everything. He's not going to let you down. And those answers are answers we need to internalize in our hearts so that as we walk around, we too can shine forth the glory of Christ. Just like a, a golden gospel book reflects the light, so we too are to be lights that bring that authority and that hope of God. May it be so. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.